Good afternoon. It is both an honor and pleasure for me to open this digital event of DGE Paris on the issue of Beethoven's Ode to Joy, his last and ninth symphony. Um, I would, my name is Jutta Schulze Holmen. I'm the resource director within DGE Paris. And I would like to warmly welcome Member of Parliament Sabine Verheyen, our distinguished panelist, Professor Buch, Professor Fauré, and the music journalist uh, Marie König, all of which will be presented in a little bit more detail in a moment. And of course, our audience, and I see that a good number of people are already connected. The choice of today, today's date, was of course not a coincidence, but we are looking forward to celebrating another Robert Schumann Day, another Europe Day. And as you know, this is the 71st anniversary of the famous declaration of Robert Schumann. And it was indeed Robert Schumann who said the famous, famous words, et si on commençait avec la culture? And what if we started over beginning with culture? So the late Robert Schumann himself recognized the potential of culture to unite, the potential of culture to build bridges. That's why we, the European Parliamentary Research Service, felt it's appropriate to focus on culture today and more precisely on this musical masterpiece, which has been co composed by Beethoven. The, this masterpiece, our European anthem, is of course a very important building block of our joint European identity. And I personally think in the current situation, the lengthy, painful pandemic we're all experiencing, it's helpful for all of us and reassuring to remind us of this joint European identity, as I would like to call it. And I think during the last 14 months of this uh, pandemic, a lot of awareness has also been risen on the added value of joint European action. Looking and focusing on the symphony itself, and we will hear soon from the experts about its artistic and political significance. One has to notice immediately, it, there is a European dimension. It has been commissioned by the Philharmonic Society of London. It has been composed by a then deaf German composer with Flemish roots, and it has been first performed in Vienna in 1824. Someone I know is very passionate about the potential of culture to unite and feels very strongly about cultural cohesion within the European Union is Sabine Verheyen, the chair of the Committee on Culture and Education. Ms. Verheyen, you're from the European city of Aachen in Germany. You studied architecture and you're a member of parliament since 2009. You served for five years as coordinator of your political group in the Committee on Culture and Education before you were elected its chair and you chair the committee since 2019. We're very happy that you're with us today and you will stay throughout the event. Many thanks for avail av your availability and you have the floor. Thank you. much first for organizing this wonderful event because I think it's uh, at the right time uh, to do this, not just because of the anniversary of uh, Ludwig van Beethoven, but also in these times we are living in to show how much culture has an impact on our European Union and our societies. Uh, but let's come to the uh, anthem, to the uh, uh, ode to joy, oder an die Freude, we say in Germany, the, uh, to joy, uh, it's I think the English title. In, 1820, in the 1820s, Ludwig van Beethoven actually wanted to compose a purely instrumental symphony, but then uh, the idea of breaking the traditional forms of the genre uh, with a choral movement stuck with him. And he did what he had long intended to do, namely, to set to uh, music, Friedrich Schiller's uh, uh, 1785 poem, uh, An die Freude to Joy, uh, whose uh, a French revolution fueled utopia of a society of equal people, united by joy and friendship, was close to his heart. 
And uh, if you think to the idea of the European Union, you see directly some parallel ideas behind that. After its premiere in Vienna, 1824, the Ninth Symphony received much criticism from con contemporaries because of its last part. Uh, it was not until the 20th century that it was made into a celebratory and representative piece also because of its last part. In 1972, the Council of Europe declared Freude Schöner Götterfunken to be the European anthem, uh, which the European community adopted in 1985. The justification was this music with its, with, with its pathetic be embraced millions, symbolized values shared by all, and unity in diversity, which is the motto of the European Union. With this masterpiece, Beethoven created a work that has moved and provoked the world since it was first heard. When the Bastille was stormed in Paris in 1989, Beethoven was 19 years old, a young guy. Uh, it is the beginning of the French Revolution. The urban masses and the peasants uh, sweep aside the monarchy and make way for a new society which the revolutionaries expect to bring liberty, equality, and fraternity, values we still have in the European Union. Beethoven is an ardent supporter of the democracy movement, but the hopeful period that the French Revolution seemed to usher in ends in disappointment for him and many others. And when Napoleon crowned himself emperor in 1804, Beethoven saw the ideals of the revolution betrayed. How Beethoven wants to oppose the conservatism of those in power with his music. But his gradually progressing deaf deafness makes it, make, made it impossible for him to perform as a pianist. So he devotes himself above all to composing. For the artist who then lives in Austria, a poem from the revolutionary years is of particular importance. And Friedrich Schiller's Ode to Joy, the verses describe a society beyond oppression, hatred, and poverty, a world of equal people connected by the bond of joy and friendship. Beethoven was aware of the significance of its last symphony in which he crossed many musical boundaries. Freude schöner Götterfunken from the final movement of the symphony has become uh, um, and now, now may, uh, take a German word, the light motif for peace and international understanding as the European anthem. Orchestras all over the world played Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in various occasions, such as New Year's Day, and this underlines its importance for international cultural dialogue. The UNESCO included the autograph of the Ninth Symphony in the International Register of the Memory of the World program in 2001. The Ninth Symphony is a key work of symphonic music, and no composer in subsequent times was able to get past it without dealing with it. In particular, the great symphony of the second half of the 19th century would have been inconceivable without it. Our official European anthem does not intend to replace the national anthems of the EU countries, but stands for the values that our European countries share, freedom, peace, and solidarity. Official minutes of the meeting of the then European communities from the 13th of April in 1971 state that there should be no competition for the European anthem because there were tunes that had universal value for Europeans. The last parts of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony would have such value and the composer was justly regarded as one of the greatest of European geniuses with no particular nationality connotation. That was a citation of the, of the, of the protocol, of the minute. All men become brothers. That fits the European idea. Nevertheless, only the instrumental version was declared the European anthem. Why was it like this? What was the reason? They did want to give preference to any of Europe's many languages and the language of music is, after all, universal. And today, Beethoven's Ode to Joy rings out during the coronavirus crisis, too. 
a call went out on social media networks for a musical flash mob to take place. Word quickly spread all over Europe. People sang and played the ode to joy at their windows, from balconies, and even in abandoned cultural spaces, creating a sense of community in times of increasing isolation. The choice of the musical piece to be performed is symbolic. Beethoven's call for brotherhood and solidarity is more relevant now than ever. And it carries us through difficult times for democracy, through difficult times for the European Union. And it should be a piece of, of uh, symbol and friendship and belonging together and bringing cultural diversity and cultural identity in Europe uh, with this wonderful symbol of this wonderful musical piece. And I'm very happy that he composed this work at that time with the ideas behind, because it shows that ideas and, uh, ideolo and, and, and uh, uh, an idealistic world can be reality, because today we live in brotherhood, friendship and freedom. And we have all to take care that this will be also in future the case. And that's the reason why we should identify ourselves with these European ideas and values. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Verheyen, for those wonderful words of uh, inspiration um, to launch us on our way this afternoon. My name is Fergus Obera, and I'm heading the Structural Policies uh, Unit in the Research Service here, covering uh, among our policy areas, education and culture, of course. And um, I'll just, uh, for the benefit of all of our panelists and per, uh, participants, talk you through the proceedings between now and for the next hour or so. So we're going to have, um, as my colleague Jutta referred to, some very esteemed uh, speakers uh, from the world of uh, culture and uh, academia. But we'll also intersperse it with a few um, musical moments um, drawn from our parliament uh, own archives um, and elsewhere of um, particular moments when uh, the ode to joy was uh, played uh, in, in, in very special occasions. And I'll also draw your attention to a special publication that our research service um, have published just uh, yesterday and in English, en français, auf Deutsch, uh, it's the, the story, uh, indeed a very the fascinating story um, of um, the European anthem and um, our colleague uh, Cécile, who's um, mastering everything behind the scenes here, has just posted the link in the chat. Uh, for those. So we will um, begin shortly by um, having a, a first video together with a little short opinion poll uh, for the participants. Um, after that, we'll be having a, a presentation by Professor Buch, another poll and video, a presentation by uh, Professor Foray, another poll and video. And we'll have then a presentation by Marie König. And we will have time towards the end, uh, by about three o'clock, to have some uh, comments, questions, and answers um, from the uh, participants. Uh, people can put their questions um, in the chat, and Cecile will be organizing that, and together with Denise, um, passing it on. And um, and then at the very end, uh, we'll we'll ask um, our member and and committee chair, Ms. Verheyen, to uh, sum up and have some uh, uh, concluding uh, remarks for us. So, without further ado, um, we're going to do two things uh, now. And as I said, we'll have a very short um, uh, little opinion poll that pops up on your screen, just sounding out people's um, view of um, whether. Yes, it comes up already. Do we need a European anthem? And, and we heard Mrs. Verheyen speaking about the fact that we are a community of values. 
uh, words like solidarity, friendship, uh, fraternité, liberté, you know, um, and the fact that Beethoven was also a uh, political and humanist, um, not just a, um, you know, a cultural figure, but also a political figure. Um, so that's coming up there and you that will remain open for some minutes. Uh, you feel free to participate and we'll see the results later on. And now we'll begin with a little um, video. Um, Mr. Verhain referred to uh, the global dimension and this one is from El Sistema in Japan. Um, thank you very much, uh, Cecile, for sharing that with us. And um, I believe we, we now have about um, 80 uh, participants uh, tuning in uh, from, from outside. And we'll um, have a, a presentation now by uh, Professor Esteban Buch. And um, Professor Buch, um, you're a professor of music history at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in, in Paris and um, an expert on the interaction between music and politics, uh, interesting to mention. You're author of uh, the book Beethoven's Ninth A Political History, it came out in 2003, as well as numerous other essays on the composer and among your other um, works on this interesting interaction between music and politics. You also published Trauermarsch, l'Orchestre de Paris dans l'Argentine de la Dictature, and the Bormazo Affair, Opera Perversion et Dictature, and Lucas Schoenberg, Naissance de l'Avant-Garde Musicale. So um, with that uh, short introduction um, to your uh, very interesting and varied career, Professor Buch, I'll give the floor to you for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. I'm particularly happy to share some thoughts and some information about the European anthem in this context. I'll be addressing a particular point, namely the history of uh, how the uh, Ode to Joy melody came to, to become the European anthem, but there are many other aspects of uh, the ninth political history which might be pertinent, so maybe we can discuss further on. Uh, for the time being, I, I want to just start by uh, uh, recalling that the Ode to Joy became the European Anthem in 1972, in the wake of the 1970 Beethoven Bicentenary. And that might have some echoes with the recent commemoration of uh, Beethoven's birth. Uh, in 1972, that followed a political trend in the reception history of the symphony, which actually 
uh, goes back to its first performance in 1824. And it was associated with Europe already in 1845. In 1929, it became the anthem of the Pan-Europa movement, a precedent for modern European institutions. In 1985, the European Community confirmed the decision first made by the Council of Europe in 1972. And this is how it, it is today, the sonic symbol of the European Union, and arguably, even if there is some kind of nuance in that, a symbol for Europe itself. Now, as it was already recalled, only the melody was mentioned in the official text, not Schiller's text and its famous verse, Alle Menschen werden Brüder. Difficulties for translating it in all European languages and the acknowledgement that it did not speak of Europe specifically, but rather of humanity in general, were overcome through the claim that instrumental music was and is a universal language. Now, it is sad to say that the invention of the symbol also allowed a former Nazi party member, namely the conductor Herbert von Karajan, to copyright the official arrangement of Beethoven's most famous music. And this is a weird situation from a historical perspective, which I will explain in a moment. In July 8, 1971, in Berlin West, the Consultative Assembly of the Council of Europe proposed, I quote, the adoption by member states of the prelude to Ought to Joy, fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, as the European anthem. And the reason was, uh, it was considered that it was fitting, and I quote again, to choose a musical composition representative of the genius of Europe. I mean, the notion of a genius of Europe is quite anachronistic for today's uh, standard, but it meant not the genius in the enhanced uh, romantic uh, idea of a person being a genius, like Beethoven, for instance, but rather something like a cultural spirit belonging to, or attributed at least, to Europe. Now, a few days after this resolution, promoted by French congressman René Radius, the Secretary General, Lugeton Six Orange, of the Council of Europe, wrote to Herbert von Karajan, I quote, After consulting with several colleagues in the Assembly, I would like to ask you to conduct the official version of the anthem. To make this happen, I will place complete trust in your wishes and suggestions, including everything related to the orchestra and the location of the performance. End of quote. And the manager of the conductor responded, Mr. von Karajan is very interested in the prospect of arranging the Ode to Joy and conducting it for a recording. This document shows that the idea of assigning Karajan not only to perform the anthem, but also to be in charge of its arrangement, came not from the Council of Europe, but from Karajan himself. Now, in January 12, 1972, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe thanked Mr. von Karajan for a collaboration they thought free of any financial benefits for him, except for the commercial exploitation of the recording. The copyright issue came during the preparation of the launching of the anthem for Europe Day on May 5, 5th, exactly 49 years ago today. And it quickly became a concert, a concern for many people, witness among many other documents, uh, this one, which I might, uh, I hope you are seeing. It's an inner memorandum from the Council of Europe from which we can retain this uh, quotation at the left. The copyright issue seems indeed to be a concern for many people. They think that Mr. Herbert von Karajan should be persuaded to give up his royalties. And this was a view which was shared by no one else than the Secretary General, Don Chick Sorinch himself, as other documents show. Now, in response, the conductor argued that his arrangement was an original work and insisted for the score and recording being done with short music and Deutsche Grammophon. In April 72, the Secretary General confessed that, I quote, he would have liked to obtain Mr. Karajan's agreement to give up these rights completely, 
but that was unfortunately not possible in view of the precedent which would be created. End of quote. And I must say that he did not say a precedent for what, actually. Uh, the question is, what original work was that, according to Karajan's claim? Uh, his score is in D major, like the finale of the Ninth Symphony. It begins with a four measures introduction in the dominant chord, lifted from measures 77 to 80 of the fourth movement. It continues with the melody played twice, first by the strings, then as a solemn march variation, exactly as in measures 140 to 187 of the instrumental part of the ninth fourth movement. And it concludes exactly like the four major transition that in the choral part follows each stanza of Schiller's poem. So I give this precise information in order to be able to weigh what the notion of an original work means in that context. And now I would like to play the music in question, namely the original 1972 arrangement uh, played by uh, the Berlin Philharmonic and Herbert von Karajan as a conductor. Here is the music as it stands. Thank you very much, um, Professor Buch, and uh, including for that um, excerpt from the 1972 commissioned playing. And it's indeed the version uh, that um, we have all um, heard so often and become familiar with. And um, of course, uh, we learned that it also came at a price. Um, and it's uh, another reminder that building Europe has never been easy and never without controversy, um, but it's good to be aware of those different dimensions of it and um, including on the, as you uh, refer to the choice of words and um, alle Menschen werden Brüder and uh, so, but it was looking on a global scale as opposed to just Europe. But then we're also recalling that as, as we celebrate in a couple of days time, Europe Day, uh, that the um, Schumann Declaration began with the words la paix mondiale, world peace was the ultimate uh, goal and ambition beyond looking beyond uh, Europe borders from the very outset. So 
Uh, thank you for that. And just to mention the, the, the poll that was uh, opened and closed there at the beginning, um, do we need a European anthem? The overwhelmingly of the um, participants, um, 53 out of the 56 who participated in it said, yes, we do. It's a straightforward uh, question. When we get down to some of the details of what kind of anthem and uh, words or no words, that might become a bit more complex. Um, and therefore, the, the next poll we're going to open um, now is precisely that. Do we need lyrics for the ode as an EU anthem uh, of a multilingual society, the European Union of 24 official languages? So that's opening. Uh, Cecile will open it for you now. And we will then watch um, uh, two uh, videos uh, together, two versions of the O to Joy being played in the Parliament. So you have a choice of answers there if you'd like to uh, participate while we're listening to these next uh, videos. Thank you. So that uh, one there was from 1992 and was um, played in the uh, chamber of the what's the, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which was used also by the European Parliament when it met in Strasbourg before the new building was opened in, in 1999. And you saw in the centre there uh, Simon Veil, who was um, uh, um, the, the first um, president uh, of the directly elected um, parliament in 1979. At, at that time, Egon um, Klepsch uh, was uh, the, the president, but and Simon Veil uh, in the 70 years of the European Parliament, um, of course, directly uh, elected and, and prior, prior to that, would have only two women to have held that post in, in 70 years. Um, and then we were going to watch um, the the other one, the one from uh, last year uh, as well. If you have that one there, Cecile. No. Okay, seems to be an issue with that one. So let's then um, move on, and I will give the floor next to um, Professor François Faure. Um, who is Professor of Political Science in the Institute of European Studies at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. And um, uh, Professor Faure, you're also a Fellow at the Robert Schumann Center in the European University uh, Institute in uh, Fiesole, Florence. 
Um, and um, Professor Faure is an expert on political sociology, comparative politics, and his research focuses on some very interesting areas, EU politics, institutions and policies, also the legitimization of political orders, and the interaction between politics, culture, religion and values. Um, and he also does some work, uh, comparative work between Europe, uh, Japan and the United States. So, Professor uh, Fauré, la parole est à vous. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, indeed, thanks also for the presentation. And uh, no need to say that I enjoyed very much the video from Japan. Uh, again, Japan is my second love after Europe. Um, after the historical background offered by uh, Mr. Bo, uh, I would like to follow as a political scientist. And uh, a political scientist focuses more on present time and on politics. And, on conflict also, uh, and the missing video uh, will be uh, integrated in my presentation. So, I would like to ask two questions uh, uh, quickly. What is the role of a good symbol in politics, first? And against this background, uh, how does the, the anthem uh, qualify as a symbol? What is a good symbol? Let's say that a good symbol is supposed to create both unity and conflict unity first, uh, because of course a symbol is a kind of rallying point, huh? it's a way, and here I speak uh, like an anthropologist, uh, it's a way to create solidarity without consensus. So a good symbol is polysemic, uh, it, could, it can be the recipient of different meanings, different worldviews, so people sharing uh, little in common may meet under the same flag, uh, interpreted differently and ignore their divergences for a while. But of course, uh, and the boundary uh, is uh, fragile, different meanings may mean conflict over the interpretation of the symbol. And these conflicts may break into open wars. So the resilience of political communities is showed precisely by their capacity to remain the arenas of expression of these conflicts of interpretations, and hopefully uh, the arenas of solution of these conflicts and the place where you agree how to disagree. That's why symbols are very good to stone of political community. So this is a very quick definition uh, of symbols. With this definition, against this definition, what is the potential of uh, the anthem to, to be a good symbol? And so to create unity and to manage uh, this. Uh, Starting with unity, I would like to uh, refer to the first findings of a survey I coordinated in uh, December to, to, uh, 2020 uh, in eight member states, uh, uh, in short, uh, the largest ones plus uh, the most uh, controversial one, Hungary. Uh, it's still unpublished, but I am happy to share the, the data with you uh, without giving too much figure, too many figures. Huh? But uh, the purpose uh, of the survey is uh, to analyze the cultural and normative foundations of European integration, dealing, uh, for example, with uh, European way of life and uh, other topics like that. And there is one question and symbols, so it offers an empirical source to know how the anthem uh, fares compared to other European symbols. To put it uh, bluntly uh, and uh, to, to keep it short, the anthem receives a mild consensus. It is a popular symbol, uh, less popular than uh, what suggests, uh, unfortunately, or uh, survey uh, up here. Uh, but it's not the most popular symbol and it's backed, it is backed with moderate intensity. Citizens are asked, what is a good symbol of the European Union? And uh, we uh, keep here only the good or very good answer. Uh, it is a good symbol, it is a very good symbol. The front runners, without surprise, are the flag and the euro, between uh, 55 and 65% of good, very good. Next, we have a second uh, package the motto, uh, United in that Diversity, the Anthem, again, as you have to join, and Europe's Day. And here we are between uh, 40 and 47 percent. And finally, uh, last group, huh? the president of the European institutions and the seats 
of the European Union, Brussels and Strasbourg, and there is no hidden joke about the relationship between uh, leaders and seats. Huh? But uh, here we are just around uh, 35%. So, in short, the anthem is perceived well, but without special enthusiasm compared to other uh, European symbols. If we dig a bit and uh, if we uh, refer these results to uh, underlying cleavages, uh, the usual cleavages, we see that, like the other European symbols, the anthem is not very discriminating in terms of uh, age, of gender, of socioeconomic factors. Still, there is one significant point that we can keep in mind. The anthem, like the other European symbols, is more popular in new member states than in older member states. It may be an interesting point uh, because it shows the usual distinctions between uh, politics, everyday politics, uh, at the level of rulers, uh, for example, uh, Hungarian rulers uh, in uh, some tensions with uh, European institutions, and the long durée of social representations. Uh, the citizens of new member states still uh, back uh, the idea of Europe and uh, its relevant symbols. Overall, the same can be said of the anthem uh, or of any other European symbol and also of European identity. It is something intertwined with national identity, and here national symbols. It is something secondary to national identity and to national symbols. It is somewhere in the background, but it's not very silent at individual level or in daily routine. However, there is a difference between individual level and institutional or collective level. The European reference, the open symbols, may take more salience at collective level. So, to say it uh, in other words, when you say I, you may not sing as you to joy, but when you say we, especially when you are confronted to cultural difference, to otherness, the tune may, uh, may change a bit, and the tune may become more conflictual. Because generally speaking, uh, symbols get attention mostly when they create a controversy. We had this example uh, when uh, uh, British MEPs uh, turned their, their backs uh, during the playing of the open anthem. Maybe we will see the, the video after. Uh, it created a rather negative reaction, uh, negative media coverage. And uh, for example, the hashtag uh, not in my name uh, flourished all over social networks. So this gesture was not well received by, uh, by Europeans. In any case, this episode is not new. Hein? You had uh, other similar uh, political gestures at the Parliament or in the College of Europe, and it emphasizes also that the anthem is not is that easily ritualized. It's, it's sometimes mocked, hein? why is it so solemn? And sometimes it is rejected, as it was rejected, hein, the anthem and the other European symbols, uh, when uh, the debate was uh, should uh, the symbols become a part of the European treaties uh, at the beginning of this century. Finally, uh, the answer was no. Besides, and I will finish with that, uh, uh, the handicaps of the, the attempt to be fully ritualized are known. Uh, they have been known for a long time. It was mentioned already. The fact not to have wars, the fact to have little military uses, the fact that European institutions have also little symbolic resources to uh, dramatize it, uh, because European institutions claim to be sober and functionalist, uh, too rationalist to rely uh, heavily on symbolic. So, conclusion, as indicated in its name, the anthem appear as, uh, appears as a positive and popular symbol for happy days, but I would say maybe less uh, as a symbol and as a political resource for other times, so it's a very honest and candid symbol. But the moral question could be, is it sufficient, is it sufficient to be uh, honest and candid in uh, politics to do the job? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fauché, um, for, for those um, thought-provoking words, the, the power of symbols uh, to, to rally people, to unite people, but also to provoke and uh, to um, di divide and uh, indeed um, the whole question of whether the European symbols would be in or out of the constitutional treaty um, was was a very contested one and when they were not in the final Lisbon 
uh, treaty that's from the European Parliament put them into its own rules of procedure. So that's why we always have it uh, played in the Parliament at those solemn occasions. And I think um, Cecile has now that um, moment you referred to at the opening of um, the current um, Parliament after the elections in 2019, so it was on the 2nd of July, which would have been the last um, constitutive session of Parliament where we had British members, somewhat unexpectedly because of the delay in Brexit, as, as it were. So let's see if we can play that and you can see the symbolism you're, you're referring to. Thank you, um, Cecile, for that. And that was, of course, in our um, current um, uh, chamber, in the seat of parliament in, in, in Strasbourg, a very full chamber in, in the days before social distance. Um, so, and just to say we have the result of that second poll um, and um, about do we need lyrics um, and the largest group, about half the uh, participants, 26 out of the 54 participating, said no need for lyrics. Um, and then um, about 11 said we could have translation of the original. Another 11 said maybe modern lyrics that capture the time. So we'll open another um, uh, poll um, uh, now and we can have it in the background and then we'll, we'll move on to uh, Mary Kunis and we might have one more video after that. But the, the poll that Cecile will open for us now is, um, is a famous piece of classical music a good idea for a modern entity such as the EU? So that will be on in the background. And then we're going to uh, hear from uh, Mary Kunis who studied um, uh, music journalism at uh, Dortmund University and works as a freelance journalist and presenter. And since nine, uh, 2019, she's moderated a live um, weekly Musik uh, journal program on Deutschlandfunk. And uh, she's also an author and producer um, of uh, programs for um, Westdeutschland and Sudwestdeutschland Rundfunk and other public service broadcasters. And she's previously worked um, for the Podium Festival in uh, Esslingen and the Alto Theater um, in uh, Essen and the Dortmund uh, Theater. So um, without further ado, uh, Marie Kunisch, I give you the floor. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation and I want to directly go into it. I want to invite you to a scenario that you can imagine maybe. Um, yeah, it's about a man who returns from war. He returns after war to Europe. He was in exile and he was maybe on another continent, maybe in the USA, and he comes back to Europe and he sees that everything is destroyed. And amidst the ruins, the returnee sings of the artistic monuments of Europe that he kept in mind while he was in exile. He sings of Rembrandt, he sings of Gothic churches, and also of Beethoven. This scenario is in a chanson by Henrik Blichmann. It's called The Last Tourist in Europe. Blichmann was a Danish pianist and he wrote it in 1947 after the Second World War. And this chanson is a melancholic song, opening a great contrast between reality and memory, between bleeding post-war Europe on the one hand and the artistic treasures of the European continent on the other. The protagonist of the song is the eponymic last tourist who recalls the artistic monuments in his mind. He's not a native who proudly sings about the works of art of his homeland, but an observer who looks at these symbols of European culture like a stranger from outside. In the chanson, Beethoven appears like a monument, iconic, next to Dresden Castle or the Eiffel Tower, like a weather-beaten building from another era, in front of which one stands in awe and whose perfection and mastery one admires, but which is so big that you can't really get close to it. In a way, this also applies to the Ode to Joy, a work that stands for Beethoven like hardly any other. An iconic work that can be quite overwhelming in its grandeur and in its famous bars does not leave much room for personal feeling. What is at the core of the piece are ideals, not the everyday sorrows of an individual human being. Even in Beethoven's lifetime, the Ode to Joy became an icon and as such it appears in a film that has also become world famous for its music, A Clockwork Orange by Stanley Kubrick. This film's hero is Alex. He's a teenager who wanders about in the suburbs of London and he commits violence for fun, out of boredom and in search of a sense of purpose and his place in society. In this film, the Ninth Symphony is used as a musical leitmotif that comes over again and again because Alex loves Beethoven and the Ode to Joy especially. And there's a special scene where the Ode appears prominently it takes place in Alex's favorite pub, a milk bar, where a woman sings the famous bars of Freude schöner Götterfunken. It's a rather absurd scenario in which the music has an uplifting effect on Alex. It makes him happy, it sends him into a frenzy, just like his violent fantasies. Beethoven's music is meaningful here on several levels. On the one hand, it's a cultural symbol underlining that Alex is a cultivated, intelligent person coming from a bourgeois society. And perhaps it also represents the hope that even violent Alex still has a soul, can feel deep joy and pleasure, even if this joy is rather questionable and strange as it is intimately entangled with violence in his case. On the other hand, later in the film, Beethoven's music becomes a means of torture because Alex is being conditioned with Beethoven's music and the music shall serve as a cure to his addiction to violence. The philosopher Slavoj Žižek has examined the ode with regard to its use in the Clockwork Orange. He proposes an interesting term for the ninth. He calls this work an empty container into which anyone any political system, any person in any time, can put whatever they deem fitting, even if they are completely opposite ideas. It's a musical container made out of powerful harmonic building blocks, dazzling timbres, catchy melodies, and a text whose message seems to be unambiguous. Because on the surface, the fourth, move, the fourth movement symbolizes an idea of humanism, the ideal of brotherhood, in A Clockwork Orange, however, precisely these ideals are questioned. Who are all and who exactly is represented by the brothers in Schiller's text? And does a society also have room for those who do not meet our standards of community? 
Zizek thinks that there is a place of exclusion, as he calls it, in Beethoven's music. He assumes that the ode to joy is not quite as all-encompassing as it is often interpreted, that Beethoven already composed a knowledge of exclusion into it, because after the big choir has sung, the noble melody, as you know it, is transformed into a march-like rhythm who questions the pathetic gesture from before. And the exclusion also becomes clear in the passage claiming that all those who do not possess certain qualities and don't behave, behave in a, a certain way should steal themselves crying from this covenant, in German, weinend aus diesem Bund stehlen. Perhaps this is why Alex loves Beethoven so much. He identifies with the position of the outsider and understands the ambigu ambiguity of his music. He understands that the joy sung about can never be all encompassing and real. It will always remain an ideal. For me personally, there's another moment of exclusion in this work in a place that I stumble over again and again because Friedrich Schiller's beautiful but rather old fashioned text only includes brothers, not sisters. And neither does it include all those who identify neither as brothers nor as sisters. Of course, one could say, there was no talk of these things back then in 1824. And yet, this fact distances the work even further from me, who today, as a young woman, stands before it in amazement. I don't really feel that the O to Joy is my hymn, but I view it from the outside, like a tourist. And this perspective prevents me from really making the work my own. And here I speak as a white person who grew up in an educated middle-class middle home in Germany and who otherwise rarely feels excluded thanks to the privileges that, I've got, that I got. What effect does the European anthem have on all those who seek protection here and have lost a loved one on the way across the Mediterranean Sea? Isn't it cynical to sing of all men becoming brothers if only they seek joy facing these images? How can one deal with the auto joy if one wants to take it seriously? In my search for an answer, I came across a quotation from Martin Geck and Peter Schleuning in their book written on Bonaparte from 1989. It states, I quote, We do not have to keep the Beethoven room in our spiritual parental home as a memorial. We can also bring in some fresh air and move in ourselves. What an invitation. We don't have to leave Beethoven as our ancestors shaped him. No, we may ar arrange the room as we please, air it thoroughly, perhaps rearrange a few pieces of furniture and fill the room with our thoughts. And I want to give you two short examples that put this idea into practice. The first is the program Be Beethoven by Podium Esslingen, the festival I worked with for several years. Be Beethoven was part of the program for the Beethoven anniversary last year. It was a fellowship program that supported 12 young artists who are going their very own way and almost stubbornly look ahead in the spirit of Beethoven's unconditionality. They have taken Beethoven's ideals and thoughts as inspiration to make something that is entirely their own. Of course, they could deal with Beethoven's music, but they didn't have to. Rather, it was about questions like, what would Beethoven create in our time and what do his ideas have to do with me? The 12 young artists answered these questions in very different ways. And in my opinion, they have succeeded in setting up their own Beethoven room, which they now inhabit. Just like the composer Gordon Campe. He wrote a letter to Beethoven personally as part of another project initiated by the Deutschlandfunk. And in this second project, more than 30 artists wrote a very personal letter to Beethoven. Kampe's letter is much about his first encounter with Beethoven and how he approached the great composer later as a composer himself. And I want to quote a paragraph from this letter as well. Gordon Kampe writes, Dear Beethoven, you have become a kind of living room for me. I have the impression that I know my way around you, that I even know the sofa crevices with the popcorn from last year, that I can sit on the sofa with you sometimes without having to admire you all the time. For me, you don't even stand on a pedestal. I don't want to storm an image of you. I don't worship you because you are a human being. 
For me, this is one of the most beautiful images for dealing with Beethoven's music and him as a person to see Beethoven not only as a humanist, but above all as a human being. And his Ode to Joy not only as a philanthropic masterpiece, but to allow the ambivalence that lays within this piece. I think this perspective could not only be a way of dealing with a work of music and an anthem, but also an ideal that can be really realized among the people living in Europe. If we say goodbye to the everlasting and big and monumental ideas and give really room to meet each other, then we can turn from being tourists into being locals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marie König. Um, for doing extremely well what we expect journalists in our democratic societies to do, which is to ask hard questions to make us feel uncomfortable and take us out of our comfort zones and challenge uh, some of the uh, ideas we have. So do we, yes, we need ideals, we need values, but can they be overwhelming, intimidating? All of these are questions uh, yes, we believe in, in Brüderschaft, Fraternité, but uh, where are the sisters, uh, uh, you know, included in this and, and so many other challenging questions and we will have time for Q&A as well. Um, not everyone might feel, as you say, um, ownership of the O to Joy, but the result of our poll uh, there that it, about whether a piece of classical music, not necessarily this one, is um, suitable for a modern entity. Overwhelmingly, 50 out of the 53 participants said yes, a piece of classical music uh, is suitable. Um, so that's probably our uh, Andy Freude is here to stay. Um, but maybe, um, as I say, in the instrumental version without uh, the words. Um, we have one more uh, video to show before we, we go to, uh, we'll have time for questions as well. And uh, the, the last video is the most recent um, and somewhat unusual uh, Europe Day that we, we marked on the 9th of May last year. Um, I mean, it's broadcast from the um, chamber here in Brussels, um, but it was a virtual ceremony. So if Cecile can um, play that, please. Wij spelen in het Rotterdam Philharmonisch Orkest. We moeten ons aanpassen aan een nieuwe werkelijkheid. En oplossingen vinden om in elkaar te steunen. Creatieve krachten helpen ons hierbij. En laten we out of the box denken. En innovatie gebruiken om het samen te doen. En ons verbond met elkaar te blijven voeren. Als we het samen doen, gaan we ons lukken. Thank you, um, Cecile, for that. And um, so we, as I say, we, we have uh, some time uh, for questions and uh, take a, a first round. Um, the questions have been coming in on the chat. And so I've picked one for um, each of our uh, three uh, um, panelists. Um, and um, if Ms. Verheyen would also like to comment, feel free on any of these, but let me just read them all three and then you've time to prepare. 
Um, so one was addressed to Professor Buch. Um, do we need the von Karajan uh, orchestration of the ode um, in order for it to be used as an EU anthem? Um, another one was addressed to Professor Fauché um, and whether modern lyrics, uh, if they were added to, uh, to the ode, would the hymn resonate better um, among EU citizens, do you think? And uh, one also was addressed um, uh, to uh, Frau König. Um, how did Beethoven influence pop music um, uh, as, as a representative of the younger generation here? Um, and is this a way to help us to make Beethoven um, more uh, relevant and, and resonating in our uh, current time? So it was uh, initially one question uh, to to each of you, and I'd 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 start with Professor uh, Buch. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much for this important question. Actually, do we need it? Uh, my feeling is that we do not. Uh, on one side, as I tried to show very quickly, there is no no such a thing as an ori original work there. Actually, what uh, Karajan did was to cut and paste three bits of Beethoven's score, I mean literally, to add a rollentando and trombones. That's, uh, that's it. I mean, uh, so definitely we don't need it. And I would like to conclude actually, which I didn't earlier, by saying that it's not only a matter of our copyright, so I mean, we are still, we collectively are still paying uh, for the arrangement, and I think it's a weird situation. And by the way, it's weird also the fact that we don't know how much, because that information is protected because of uh, regulations about privacy, which is very, it's fine for me, but actually it has a paradoxical consequence, namely that we as Europeans are not allowed to, to know the whole story about the anthem. But besides the copyright thing, I think that the important uh, level of discussion is political, of course. What does it mean to have the signature of a former Nazi party member on the, uh, in, on the anthem of a, a union which, as everybody knows, was built in order to foster democracy and peace and freedom in Europe? And I think it would be a wonderful gesture, and I linked it to the uh, anniversary of uh, Beethoven's birth, I mean the recent commemoration which happened, it didn't really happen because of the pandemics. I mean there is something to catch up in my humble opinion and something to be done there because actually as we, sh as we saw in the precedent video, the practice is already going uh, somewhere else. I mean there are more versions of the anthem which are available the one which was played uh, in front in this video before was a wonderful example of the fact that the answer is clearly no, we don't need it. And I think that to say it would be a wonderful gesture to reinforce the, the commitment to democracy and uh, to peace and freedom for the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Buch, for this comprehensive answer. And I'd pass on to uh, Professor Fauché. Um, I fear I am a uh, non-believer in lyrics. <laughs> uh, first, because uh, there is a question, should, fin, would it be a good thing? I don't think so. And is it possible? I don't think so. And uh, especially in Latin or Esperanto, because for me it's uh, almost a joke, uh, this uh, option, and it could be very counterproductive. So we have to live with that. I think it's an open symbol, and indeed it can be democratic as such. We have also maybe to refer to some past cases huh, uh, regarding the plasticity of the, of the anthem compared to national anthems. Uh, if you play with uh, La Marseillaise, uh, you will have a big, big, big conflict. Huh, uh, refer to the version by, uh, um, his name is escaping me, uh, of Serge Gainsbourg, for example. Many people played uh, with the European anthem. And again, I'm speaking of the political symbol. Uh, I'm not a musicologist, so I really focus on the political dimension of the piece. Uh, you had reggae, uh, you had uh, all kinds of versions, and it was just 
playful or for some ridiculous, but it was not really a matter of political conflict, uh, meaning a conflict that can structure after that a community even based on dissent. So I don't think that's the option. And this is said of the anthem, but it could also be said of other uh, European symbols. And again, discussing that, it's not just uh, an artistic uh, discussion, it's already very serious, huh? uh, but we are discussing Europe and you could replace European anthem by European Union. Thank you very much for that. And, and then Ms. Kunich, I mean, we're launching also on Sunday uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe. Um, I don't know if this is something that might come back on the table um, about um, reinserting uh, into, into the treaties uh, symbols, uh, including this, and what, what uh, is a, you know, a way to get more young people engaged in general in, in Europe, not just on, in the anthem. I don't know if um, you'd like to comment on that. Yes, uh, thanks. It's um, really interesting. I saw a really great mashup that I would recommend to everyone. <laughs> it's a mashup from Beyoncé songs with Beethoven um, motifs. And I think it's really great. It's a really playful way by Sam Tsui, I think is the name of the singer. I can really recommend that. And I think it shows that sometimes pop music and pop artists are a little bit less um, yeah, stressed or a little bit less um yeah thinking about what is right doing with the music of beethoven and more getting into a play with it and using it just like a musical um motive and thing to do and this is really nice and i read also a really interesting study by um musicologist uh, michael custodis and he found out that there are lots of fans of beethoven's music in pop culture and that they are able to yeah get a new connection to beethoven's music um, in maybe also questioning the cliches that lay within the com both in the person and also within the work of him. And um, yeah, that this is also a possibility maybe for young people to get engaged with it and also for young people to show that maybe you don't ever have to um, hear Beethoven only in his original form, but also get engaged with it and put your personal flavor to it. And uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I can recommend watching this video. And of course, it has influenced lots of more people, but I think the time is now almost over, so I stop here. <laughs> well, thank you much, very much. That was a very, very nice uh, contribution. You can feel your, your your passion for music in general, you know, uh, coming across there. That's that's uh, very important. But indeed, time has caught up with us. So. Um, Thank you to all of the uh, panelists, the speakers and participants, and I, I'll give the last word to our committee chair, our chair of our Culture and Education Committee, uh, Zabina Verheyen, please. Thank you very much, but please allow me also to come back to a few points that were said before in my closing remarks. Uh, when it comes to the question of do we need lyrics or do, do, do we just need the music? I think the decision was quite wise uh, just to take the music as the anthem for Europe and not the, the text, not because the text is bad or because the text doesn't cover women, because in the original German version, it means all human beings become brothers. And that's a total different thing than in the English translation, all men become brothers, because that can be misunderstood, especially when you are not a, a, a a uh, native speaker of English language where man stands also for humankind, for, 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 for all human beings. Uh, in our modern understanding of German uh, feministic approach on language, it doesn't fit anymore. But in other cultures, other languages, reminding uh, uh, Spanish uh, senores pasajeros and also the women who want to fly to the next uh, destination are included. I think there are differences in Europe and that makes it quite important that we accept differences, that we accept common things, that we have the different values, that we are united in the diversity. And that covers this anthem also with the original lyrics that stands behind for which they are composed. And I think that's the reason why in our uh, um, survey today, uh, nine, more than 94% says, yes, we need a European anthem. And even British anti-European politicians turn around 
that shows how important it is in the end to have these symbols because that are the points where you can discuss on. And it were just those who want to leave the European Union who turned around. And it was not just because of the anthem, but because of their fundamental position towards the European Union as such. So it shows for me more clearly that this anthem stands also as a symbol for Europe, like the flag, because not as well known by everyone, but I think it is still an important symbol for what, what we want to do, to bring together people in Europe. And when I, in the, in the campaign for the last European elections, was at very many events from, Pulse, uh, from the organization Pulse of Europe. And I think most of you know this uh, uh, initiative. It was one of the wonderful, the, 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 the most beautiful moments when at the end of these events, all people came together, took their hands and, and sang together the European anthem, the ode of joy, the symbol of we are together in a positive mood. We want to fight for this common Europe and this music shows it in a very emotional way. And I always had chicken, uh, uh, in, in, in Dutch we, uh, it said uh, Kipperfell, in German we say uh, Hühnerhaut, uh, uh, Gänsehaut, I don't know what's in English. Uh, Mr. Biere, perhaps you can help me with this in, in English language. But it, it was so emotional at that moment that I think we need also these emotional moments and emotional symbols for this European Union. Because if we just think the European Union as a rational economical thing where we uh, come together or just discussing in a rational way about values, but don't have the emotional component which brings music, I think it's, it's a shortcoming of what Europe needs. And that's the reason and that might be also my final words with combined with a warm thank you and uh, uh, to all of the participants, to those who organized this event today. Uh, I think we need this emotional identity also in Europe, not just rational, but we need to, to touch uh, European people, the, the people in Europe also with their hearts, with their emotion, with the culture, uh, uh, to bring Europe really together and to close again with what Esteban Buch al already said, or uh, now I think it was uh, Jutta Schulze Holmen. If Robert Schumann would fund the European Union from you, would found it in, a, in another way, he would start with culture, he said when he became older. And I think that's one of the important things we see today. And as chair of the uh, Committee on Culture and Education, I always claim for this. If you see the European Union just as a political and economical club, it's not enough. We have common values. We have also common roots in our culture and music especially. And our history shows that very clear that there were times where we were in the cultural scene more together than today and uh, that we should remind that we have a common history in culture uh, uh, in, in the European Union and that we influenced each other, uh, not just with political decisions, but mainly with our culture. And that is the reason why I think culture should be one of the core politician, polit uh, political fields and issues we should deal with on the European level. And it should become center of our political discussions also for the future of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, uh, very much, Madam Chair, Ms. Verheyen, for, for those um, concluding words of inspiration. Um, and indeed, uh, to help linguistically, we were talking about goose pimples, is what goose we call pimples. in English. <laughs> you see, goose pimples. And um, also for reminding us that it was only a minority of the, the British members who were uh, anyway fundamentally opposed to the European project who decided uh, to show disrespect for the, in that way, if not the anthem just, but for their colleagues. Um, but the overwhelming majority did not. And I got goosebumps on the last day in which the British members were participating. And you can watch that on YouTube where those uh, who are very sad to be leaving 
did join hands and sang Old Lang Syne, which is a, a Scottish um, hymn normally sung for, for New Year's Eve. And it was a very emotional, I'm, I'm sure you, you remember it. So music has the power to move and culture does. And we're doing our best at EPRS to keep culture very much at the beating heart of Europe through this kind of event. We did one also recently on the new European uh, Bauhaus initiative, again, part of our shared European cultural heritage. And this is something very um, real to people. And we, we do our best to try and uh, promote that. And I draw your attention uh, once again to the, our publication that gives the whole history in the three languages of, of this uh, anthem as we come to the 9th of May this week. So thank you once again, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to our esteemed uh, panel of uh, speakers, historians, musicologists, journalists. So Professor Esteban, Professor Fauré and, and Marie uh, König. Um, and uh, for your participation and to all of you um, for uh, joining in and participating in, in, the, in the chat with your questions. We couldn't get to them all, unfortunately, and uh, to the po opinion polls. So thank you all. Have a lovely afternoon and we hope to see you at another EPRS event in the not too distant future. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>